Can we start, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, voice should be a little more louder. We'll start. Hello. Can I? Can we start now? Is it okay? The voice is okay. Yeah. Fine. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Hi, welcome back. So today we'll be talking about uh, complicated plural effusions. That's like it's a more common topic, and more, many a times we don't know actually what we need to do when and all that. So in an attempt to dispel all these doubts, we'll talk about complicated plural effusions from a surgeon's point of view. I might not be discussing much about the biochemical aspects and all, but from the surgical aspects. We will talk about complicated plural effusions. So this talk will be divided into five topic, five parts. So I'll be talking about the why we need to talk about this, the what, when, and the who, management options that are available, when does the surgeon come in, and then last, how I do it. Why do we need to know about this topic at all? What is so important about complicated plural effusion? You just see an effusion, you drain it, and uh, you really don't need to worry much about it. You just put him on ATT. That's what's pretty much happening in our world or in our country, rather. So let's see why. This problem has been present since 376 BC, where uh, Hippocrates, the, uh, one of the earliest physicians whose oath we all follow, he let out empyema by making a gash on the chest wound and putting his finger in and letting out the pus. This was pretty much the management till maybe around the 17th century or the 18th century till the surgical technique started. And top it all, there was a study in 2012, thoracic empyema, a 12-year study from a UK tertiary cardiothoracic referral center. Empyema is an expensive affair. It costs almost 500 million US dollars per year. So you can imagine the run it has on the healthcare uh, in the developed countries. Imagine in developed countries where they don't see much of TB, if it's going to cost this much. In our country where TB is a predominant, where every third person might have TB in your hospital, it's going to be equal to or much more than that. And uh, whether our country can take it or it's been taking it, but still, we should try to uh, manage it properly, more better. And then the mobility of paranemonic effusion or complicated effusion is going to be almost as high as 15 to 25 percent. They are going to require some kind of surgery. Surgery is an economic burden not only for the family and it's like the hospital beds are going to be occupied and the relatives will be coming and going. Like the economic burden is huge. And the mortality, imagine a person dying from a, a, a complicated plural effusion is going to be as high as 10 percent. These are all evidence-based. These are not my own numbers. They are just uh, part of evidence. So the what when and the who. So before that, we just I just uh, tell a small thing about LIGHTS criteria. We have to know whether this effusion, the effusion which you are looking at in a patient is going to be an exudative effusion or a translative effusion. What are the criteria for an exudative effusion? Ratio of pleural fluid protein to serum protein is greater than 0.5. Ratio of pleural fluid to serum LTH is greater than 0.6. And the plural fluid LDH is greater than two-thirds of the upper limits of normal serum value. If all of these things are negative, it is considered a transudate. So the causes of an exudative plural effusion, basically how I came to understand this is exudative effusion. You have a local problem. It causes some pathology increase in the plural fluid secretion and leads to an effusion there. So that is the exudative effusion. Transudate, when the protein goes down in the entire body, the protein is going to go down. And it's a generalized condition. There's left ventricle failure, chronic kidney disease, hepatic dysfunction, hypoproteinemia, where there's an entire, it's like the generalized condition, it also affects the plural cavity. That's how uh, we think. So when do you call it a complicated plural effusion or a paranemonic effusion? When there's a presence of plural and fluid in the effusion, it's called a paranemonic effusion which is proved by the presence of bacteria and the plural fluid as uh, proved by the culture or the gram stain and the biochemical 
criteria of the fluoro effusion this is very important when the ph of the fluoro effusion is going to be less than 7.2 and nadh is greater than 1400 international units and glucose is as less as 40 mg per dl these are all criteria to say that prudent fluoro effusion is a uh, complicated the fluoro effusion is going to become complicated or you might expect some kind of problem when you're dealing with such patients this does not necessarily mean that he's going to require surgery but some kind of complications he might develop and you need to be vigilant with these kind of patients there is a, a porcelain like this table is a nice table where these people these two people classified this complicated paranemonic effusion and pleural empyema class 1 being not significant pleural effusion and class 7 is complex empyema however most of these work most of these diagnostic work will be done by we still need to have an idea about what we need to do and who develops such complication many patients with pneumonia develop a effusion paranemonic effusion all paranemonic effusions do not go in for septation do not go in for loculation they just resolve spontaneously or might need a simple thoracosynthesis however 40% of patients with bacterial pneumonia especially streptococcal pneumonia pneumococcal pneumonia streptococcus pneumonia they go on to develop these complications of paranemonic effusions and some studies have shown complicated pleural effusions are also common in anaerobic pulmonary infections what are the risk factors extremes of age are always susceptible to developing complications pneumonia are requiring hospitalization then patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and there's no gender predisposition it's equal in both males and females and there's no racial predisposition however patients with hiv and other kinds of immunosuppression they are more likely to develop uh, this kind of complicated pleural effusions so what are the management options in a complicated pleural effusion the what i have taken for the basis of my talk is the british thoracic society guidelines these guidelines there are two sets of guidelines the accp and the bts we are generally more comfortable following the bts i don't know why but somehow our our, our evidence most of the things we are more happy following the bts guidelines so there is a diagnostic algorithm for the management of patients with pleural infection first you take the history examination and chest x ray and then if you find an evidence of pleural infection you involve the respiratory physician this is all from a general practice point of view or when you are the primary care giver however we are surgeons and we usually do not see pleural effusions up front it's often referred to us and we are not the primary care giver so you start an antibiotics to diagnose the pleural aspirate and send the fluid for culture send the fluid for gene expert for mycobacterium tuberculosis and all that and uh, histopathology whether it's malignancy rule out malignancy and all and uh, diagnostic pleural aspiration should always be done under ultrasound guidance please don't attempt a blind diagnostic pleural aspiration it is no longer considered legal and we might be in trouble if we do an a blind thing and we have seen needles going into almost all organs we have seen needles going into the lung we have seen needles going into the heart we have seen needles going into the spleen we have seen needles going into the liver we have seen needles going into the diaphragm also so the worst thing is if we do a diagnostic aspirate and the needle falls in that's really bad actually okay and then if there is pus you put a drain insert a chest tube and then if there is you don't get any fluid failed sampling then you decide to go ahead for a ct scan and you need further image guided aspiration whether you need a pigtail or something like that and then when you finally find pus you find pus yes again mark the site where you have maximum pus and then put in the chest tube no if the patient is better then i think you are on the right track your patient gets better the sepsis is resolved and the lung x ray is better and then you uh, can wait for some time if after 5 to 7 days he does not improve and his x ray is not getting any better i think he needs some kind of surgical intervention and that's where uh, we as a surgeon come in and the right side of the part is predominantly for uh, the physician where they follow and then they observe then the clinical i think by the time the patient comes to you he would have exhausted all the other options so we really don't uh, need to wait so much uh, when the patient is almost referred to you 
So as I said, USG chest and thoracentesis, I see the insertion at the appropriate point. And uh, I think I see the insertion alone requires one separate uh, lecture. And appropriate antibiotics, send the fluid for culture and, and uh, send the fluid for culture and uh, all investigations where you suspect something. If you suspect TB, the sensitivity and specificity of gene expert or what you call the uh, anyway, gene expert for TB, Bactech and the gene expert for mycobacterium tuberculosis and all that. And what is the role? A lot of, uh, I didn't want to include this talk, but uh, for the purpose of uh, completion, I would like to include pleural fibrinolysis. It is no longer done. I have never seen anybody do pleural fibrinolysis, at least in Madras Medical College or Apollo Hospitals, those two places where I work. They don't do pleural fibrinolysis anymore. But for the sake of the study and for the sake of postgraduates, I'd like to say it is not being done widely. However, there have been four randomized trials where they have done three to four doses of intrapleural streptokinase followed by saline flushes. These papers received widespread criticism saying that pleural fluid drainage and radiological improvement does not reliably predict the outcome of the patient. Your x-ray might be better, but the patient is gonna become sick. It will be like an operation success patient failure kind of concept, I don't know what. And there's also a concept that the streptokinase increases the pleural fluid drainage independent of fibrinolysis. Then what is it gonna gain? If it is not going to lyse the fibrin and it's just going to increase the pleural fluid and you'll think it's draining better, I don't think we have done any good to the patient. We're only doing more harm. And all of these papers, all of these papers had a very low number of patients and a non-uniform selection. There was no proper randomization and all. At least that's what the reviewers said, not me. There was no uniform selection. There was one paper called MIST-2, the multicenter intrapleural sepsis trial. This was a randomized trial of intrapleural TPA and DNAs in pleural infection. This study was different because they had a slightly larger sample size, around 218 or something. I'm not exactly sure. I, 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 I think I forgot the number. They used a combination of drugs, TPA and DNAs. They found at the end that there was an improved radiological outcome and there was a 4% surgical referral and a slight reduction in the hospital stay for these patients. But 4% surgical referral, imagine, out of 215 patients, 4% is like nothing but four, uh, something around eight patients or 10 patients, you might have avoided surgery. My personal opinion, the numbers do not favor intrapleural fibrinolysis, and I really don't think we should go ahead with intrapleural fibrinolysis. And that's what the British guideline, BTS guidelines make it very, very clear intrapleural fibrinolytics, there is no indication for the routine use of intrapleural fibrinolytics in patients for pleural infection. And the level of evidence is A. It's not B or C, it is A. So, then they call us, they call the surgeon, what we do when we see this uh, uh, kind of uh, patients. So there are three stages of empyema. Stage one is the exudative stage. Stage one is the exudative stage. And stage two is the fibrinopurulent stage. And then stage three is the organizing stage where most of the cases, the neglected cases and everything, they come to us. Stage one and two is usually seen by the person. Ajay has got disconnected for some reason. I hope he'll come back. Yeah, he's back. Hello. 
Yeah, Ajay. I don't know what happened. Uh, I think <laughs> it's okay. Uh, you have to put your camera on. Oh, yeah. yeah, can you right. continue, sir? Yeah, fine, fine, fine. Yeah. Okay. To get the slides on. But however, yeah, okay, mic is on. Yeah. Slides. Hello? Yeah. The Indian scenario, what we see in India, all of the data that we see and we have analyzed so far is from the US and Europe. There are not so many randomized control trials from India. I know it's like a sad situation, even though we operate maximum MPIMA in the world, we are not doing any kind of studies. And everything that we see is almost predominantly TB, 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 TB. Everybody has TB. Most of the empires that we see are TB. Very, very rarely they present in stage one and stage two. And most of them have already undergone some kind of ICD insertion or multiple aspirations over the time. And they have literally, these patients have been screwed over back and forth and then they have been sent uh, to us. Many patients also come to us with existing ICD for over six to eight weeks. All these things cause a, 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 cause a lot of damage to the chest wall and the, the anatomy of the patient. The ribs start getting crowded. When the ICD is there, it induces an intense fi inflammatory fibrotic reaction. And when you see, when you put the ICD, the patient will be like this. Afterwards, the patient will just, because of the pain and the chronic thing, he'll come to you only like this. He can't even become straight. There's an acquired scoliosis. He'll develop an acquired scoliosis. And most of these patients have the six kind of pleura with the corticopleuritis. And many of them, there's one more problem that is very, very peculiar to the Indian population. We get a lot of BPF, bronchopleural fistula. And sometimes small tubercles on the surface of the lung, they have ruptured and they'll be causing a lot of air leaks, parenchymal air leaks. And to top it all, TB is not just a disease of the pleura. It, there is always associated parenchymal disease also. And when you try to decorticate, you'll be having a lot of air leaks. But the good thing is he might not be very sick because of the ICD. The pulse pus is sterile because TB has a sterile pus unless there is a secondary bacterial infection in this patient. So why do we need to intervene at all? What happens? You just remove the ICD. If there's no air leak, remove the ICD and patient is going to be better. Uh, uh, there is a lot of evidence to suggest VAX versus conservative therapy for fibrinopurulent phase or complicated pleural effusion the light criteria three to five. Vax is more effective than fibrinolysis. Obviously, fibrinolysis, even though it's been given up, Vax is more effective than fibrinolysis. Vax causes a reduced hospital stay. Vax is safe if uh, uh, we are doing it properly and uh, a reduced cost and reduced need of open decortication. So I'm not telling open is bad. Many cases, sometimes we uh, are better off opening rather than Vax. But yeah, all these if you are able to do it with VAX, the morbidity is less and uh, the mortality depends upon the center and the surgeon who is going to do it. And two, VAX versus conservative. Can you see me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Untreated chronic empyema, as I said, causes uh, chronic volume loss. As I said, there's an acquired scoliosis. The ribs start getting crowded, and the patients develop a lot of pleuritic chest pain. And it, for long run, young patients develop a lot of respiratory compromise, and that part of the lung or that lung entire lung becomes unusable leading to a loss of respiratory function. And this causes a deformity. As I said, the scoliosis is there in the patient. And finally, it leads to a condition called trap lung, where even if you go in and decorticate, you're not going to do much for the patient except to damage the lung. And then its lung is not going to come up at all. So this is a simple flow chart, which we can think of for uh, managing complicated pleural effusion. So, when there is a complicated pleural effusion, you drain, there is no resolution, you directly go in for a VAX or an open decortication. And when there is a corticopleuritis at presentation, when there is a stage 3, corticopleuritis means thickened empyema, when there is a stage 3, 
you directly go in for uh, video assisted thoracoscopy or thoracotomy and pleural pulmonary decortication. And simple x ray alone is not enough. You definitely need a CT chest with a contrast enhancement because we need to see the pleura. So, what are the options available for management of uh, complicated pleural adhesion? We can do a single puncture thoracoscopy for stage 1 and stage 2 empyema. Then we have wax decortication. We have open decortication, which still has a role in our Indian scenario. We, we, do, uh, we do get across a lot of cases who require open decortication. And these two I have mentioned because even though we don't do it very often, uh, it still has a role in the Indian scenario. Open plural window and where when the patient is very, very sick, you just go in, take him to the theater, give mild sedation, reset part of the rib, and then come out. It's just like doing a open, uh, you just open the pleura to the atmosphere and let the pus out and then doing a thoracoplasty. This is a beautiful uh, diagram that I came across online. It's, uh, the, the reference is given below, where stage one, stage two, and stage three. Stage one in the exudative space, simple drainage alone might be enough. And uh, however, sometimes stage one, you might require a fibrinolysis and wax. Stage two, in the fibrinopurulent phase, you'll, it's better off you go for a decortication. And in the organizing phase, it's better to go for a thoracoplasty or a, uh, sorry, you go, go for a decortication only. This open window thoracostomy and thoracoplasty are reserved for patients who are not fit for any kind of radical procedures and can do only palliative procedures for them. Then you go ahead and do a open window thoracostomy or a thoracoplasty. So what do we do in our setup? So the first thing is the anesthesia. It's very, very important. A pre-op bronchoscopy is very important because you need to see whether there's any active air leak in these patients and all. Anesthesia is why our double A pediatric bronchoscopy. It's very important to confirm this position both in the supine and lateral position. Because when in supine position, the tube might be in position. After the lateral position, the anesthetist will pull the head one direction and the surgeon will try to twist the patient and make him in the lateral. This time, the tube can get dislodged and this can cause problems during surgery. So it's always better to uh, confirm both in supine and in the lateral position. And this is the positioning that we use for the patient. You can see there is a, a shoulder roll under the chest. There is a shoulder roll under the chest, making sure the rib is played, the chest wall is played. This is very important because already in these kind of chronic empyemas, the ribs are crowded together. So when you break the table like this, either by breaking uh, the table itself or you keep a shoulder roll under the chest, the rib slightly, the intercostal space widens and uh, the arms are kept above and in the, uh, we use, make use of a lithotomy rod and the arms are above and well padded pressure points because the surgery is gonna take more than two hours or four hours sometimes. And if you're not gonna protect the bony prominences, you might end up causing a neuropathy and maybe even a pressure sore later on for these patients. And that one's gonna become a medical issue for you and uh, you might have to handle all those. So the, Two types of approaches are there for wax. We have an anterior approach and a posterior approach. I, I am a proponent of the anterior approach. So I stand in front of the patient. The camera is, in, is kept behind the patient. And if you have two cameras, if your system has the luxury of two cameras, you can uh, then use, if your system has the luxury of two cameras, you can have one on either side and ask your assistant to hold one camera and all that. So ports, the best method of putting ports for uh, empyema thoracis is to pre-operative ultrasound marking the port site of empyema and trying to enter it there. However, many of times what happens is because of the ICD, the fluid has either drained or it is not, you are not able to get a proper window to mark the ports. So what we have done is, we are, I usually go in a single utility incision in the fifth space and the camera and all instruments initially go through the same port. However, it is individual, it's very, very important to individualize for each patient. And the preemptive analgesia is given 
local anesthesia is infiltrated at each port. This is a, a typical example of one of my patients that we do. Before I start my procedure, I make a lot of markings on this patient and a lot of my uh, the, the paramedical staff there will be uh, laughing at me and drawing all sorts of lines on this patient, but it's very, very important because these are the bony prominence. Scapula is a very, very important bony landmark. You mark the tip of the scapula and then you count the intercostal space from below because the upper intercostal space you cannot count reliably. The floating ribs you can feel 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and then fifth rib. The upper border of the fifth rib is the fourth space. You make a small incision around 3.5 centimeter, or at least you draw a small line 3.5 centimeter in the fourth space, and then you try to enter in enter the pleura in that space. This is, of course, depends upon the location of the empyema and all that. You should not generalize. Usually, the fourth or fifth space is the ideal space for any kind of lesion tackling any problem pathology in the chest. That's why I mark the fourth space in this patient. If required, after entering the chest in this safe point, then we can make additional ports as required. So this is the uh, uniportal approach where we use the camera and everything to the same port and uh, the ICD also goes through the same port. And in the end, we just have left with a small 4.5 centimeter incision. So just to give some examples of what stage one empyema, how what uh, what it looks like. Stage one complicated paranemonic effusion. So you can see small small fibrinous exudates are there. It is stage one going in for a stage two. So in no time it will go in for a stage two. This was done using flexible thoracoscopy, flexible pleuroscopy. You can do a small additional lysis also if you want. And then for diagnosis, you can do a pleural biopsy in the same fitting for this patient. That is the idea of doing. This is more of a diagnostic procedure and you combine it with the therapeutic aspect so that we can do. So as you can see, you're doing a pleural biopsy using that. Next, we'll, we'll see a stage two uh, empyema where you can see the pleura has already started to get thick. This is a single puncture thoracoscopy. You can see the lung there. We have marked using ultrasound, but still we were not able to get into the space properly. Yeah, now you can see we are in the pleural space. What you can see here is the pleura. And then this pleura biopsy needs to be taken and then if required, you'll require a decortication after seeing the histopathology and all that. This is also predominantly a diagnostic procedure and by this, you will also be draining the pus if there is anything inside. So, stage three, most of the cases that we get in are, in, are stage three. So, we, stage three, I have just divided this, sorry, I have just divided entry into the chest itself because the lung is going to be really plastered. So, what we do, just divided this into a few. As I said, I have marked this patient's uh, chest. This is the fifth space. After opening, you put your finger in, release the additions. The, with your finger, once you release the addition, the lung falls down. This has to be done very carefully. Otherwise, you are going to injure the underlying lung. Once you release the uh, thing with the finger, the lung falls down here. Then, with the camera just at the tip of the incision and not much inside, you use the suction or any blunt dissector to just think. And then under vision, under vision you put in the second port. You can see the second port being put in the eighth or ninth space. This camera port is being inserted under vision into the eighth or ninth space. What you're seeing here is the diaphragm. Yeah, 
So that's the port being inserted, and then our view will be changed. We'll uh, go to the camera. And see, this is the, the uh, you could see the first two cases, the pleura was how the pleura was, but uh, just see in this case how the uh, lung and the pleura looks. You can see the. I'm just incising with the diatomy. Yeah, as I release, you can see the, the pleura getting released. It's basically like an orange peel, where sometimes the orange peel is very easy to release and sometimes it's going to be difficult and cause a tear in the orange also, right? Same thing, the lung should... Yeah. See, there, that is the pleural space and then you hold it by some kind of an instrument and grasper and gently start dissecting it. A combination of blunt and dissection and uh, some kind of energy device if required, you can use it. See there, you can see in this patient, in this particular patient, it's coming easily. The pleural peel is coming easily. We just make multiple cuts. You can see it's, it's, it's getting peeled off very nicely here. And it is not enough if we do the visceral pleural. can see how the, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, hello? yes. Yeah. You can see how thick the parietal pleura is. So the principles of surgery remain the same. You need to remove the visceral pleura, you, remove, you need to remove the parietal pleura, you need to remove hilum to hilum. You have to prove from the hilum anteriorly, to the hilum posteriorly. Or on the left side, you can stop when you see the iota. On the right side, you can stop when you see the azygos. That's uh, the general rough rule where you can uh, do that. But it's preferable to do from hilum to hilum. Just because we are doing a surgery by wax doesn't mean you can do whatever you can and leave the rest to uh, for nature to take its course. No. If you are not able to get any part of the pleura, then you need to open and complete the procedure. It is not because that you're doing by wax, you're able to uh, leave behind.
Yeah. When you go inside, you can see the diaphragm when you go from the incision site and then you can see the diaphragm. And there, this is the port side that you have already seen. You take that port side out. And then, this is basically what we are doing it through the uniportal parting. Make small, small incisions and make very, be very careful not to damage the lung whenever you are doing all this. What I'm doing is basically separating the pleura from the lung, the diaphragmatic pleura from the lung. So you can see the lung and the diaphragm getting separated. So what do we need to do in the post-operative period? We, this is very important. It's our job does not end with just finishing off the decortication. We need to send the fluid and the pleural tissue or both for histopathological examination, microbiological examination, because microbiological examination in some places does not include tuberculosis testing. So we need to send the fluid and the uh, tissue for gene expert and then TB stain and culture. TB culture is very, very important because sometimes very, very rarely you can pick up the atypical mycobacterial infection where your gene expert uh, might be positive, as a gene expert might be negative, the TB stain might be, might be positive, and your micro, uh, so it, it does not correlate. Gene expert is negative, but your TB stain is positive. Then you, in the culture, if you don't follow up with the culture, these patients might end up with the atypical mycobacteria. And in very rare cases, if you're suspecting a fungal empyema, a very, very sick patient or post. Uh, post aspergilloma rupture or a most mucor mycosis which is ruptured into the pleura and all this stuff. You need to look for fungal stains. And very, very important thing, a decortication, the lung has been collapsed for a quite a long time. So even though you have released it under anesthesia, when the anesthetist is going to give the positive pressure, the lung will appear to be expanded nicely. You will be happy. Anesthetist will be happy. Your assistant will be happy. However, in the post-operative period, when you see the x-ray will look almost similar to uh, whatever it was in the pre-operative thing, except that it does not have that empyema fluid, which means uh, uh, once the positive pressure is out and the patient is Not taking the required amount of tidal volume and you do not encourage it and uh, most of these patients will have some kind of pain because you have literally stripped the pleura off the chest and the pleura is a very sensitive organ it's going to be really painful for them so if you're not going to give aggressive chest physiotherapy breathing exercises and incentive spirometry it's going to be difficult to bring the lung back up so what i suggest is to apply a controlled negative suction devices after decortication. Whether you do it by wax or by open, if you have the facility in your hospital, you get high-flying devices such as the Medalla. Have the facility in your hospital to get high-flying devices such as the Medalla. It is better to use the Medalla, but uh, uh, it's going to be a costly thing. And what is the basic three-bottle system or whatever works. Or if you have the access to the atrium drain also, you can use this. This drain, is connected to the negative section and you can see the bubbling here in this chamber C where this denotes the air leak. There is grade one to grade five air leak. This patient has a grade one air leak and this is connected to the suction. It's a controlled suction and uh, it does not cause damage to the underlying lung. However, in many places this is not available. Even in Apollo sometimes we might not be able to get our hands on it. This was actually taught to me by a uh, uh, OT brother, OT, not the OT brother, surgical institute brother, where uh, he told me how to do a simple three-bottle suction, what they use for uh, uh, cardiac surgery sometimes. So this 
is a simple two bottle icd ramses which is available routinely in all the hospitals and this is a pediatric icd bottle which i have shown here in the small bottle and these two outlets are connected using a y and then that is connected to the suction basically when you apply suction directly on the lung it is going to tear your lung parenchyma and whatever little air leak was there is going to like literally uh, tear and everything is going to uh, thing but when you apply it through the single simple single bottle also the suction is diffused and it's not a very accurate method of maintaining suction it's a very crude method but it definitely works nonetheless whatever so what are our cases we have we have had around uh, 39 cases of stage 3 and now i think we had one mortality and the mortality was due to bleeding the patient was a ckt patient and we had to convert in four patients and uh, four patients had a non expanded lung uh, without any air leak this is a very peculiar uh, uh, thing that uh, we can see in tuberculosis patients where there is no air leak there is no fluid there is uh, the icd is functioning but there is lung is not expanded completely there is a small space so we just remove the icd and we send them home and uh, ask them to do chest physio and uh, such patients usually get better with time these are all like uh, very short term follow ups we don't have any long term follow up data but the complication that i'm dreaded about is the air leak air leak is a very very uh, distressing complication for both the surgeon as well as the patient and his attendants for us we know air leak is eventually going to stop once the lung expands and sticks to the chest wall but for the attendants every time he breathes every time he coughs it's going to be uh, leaking air and then the bubbles are going to be coming and the sound will be there blah, 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 blah. that sound will be there it will be very unsettling for the attendant especially when you are going to when you are going to connect the patient to a suction it is going to like really uh, do uh, even more problems for the patient and the sound will be more actually when the suction sound will be there and this uh, bubbling sound will also be there so you need to counsel the patient pre operatively that you have to expect some amount of air leak in this uh, post decortication patient this air leak will eventually stop however if the air leak is present for more than 5 to 7 days it is termed as a persistent parenchymal air leak air leak should not be confused with a bronchopleural fistula bronchopleural fistula also you will be leaking air but there will be a continuous bubbling every time the patient talks every time the patient breathes whether it is inspiration expiration or post expiration our parenchymal air leaks or small soap bubble appearances will be there in the uh, chest tube and the uh, icd bottle this should not be confused with bronchopleural fistula bronchopleural fistula is a serious problem that requires surgical intervention most often either a lobectomy or a cpf closure with a flap or a patch or something our air leak persistent parenchymal alveolar air leak usually settle down with time and then they get better as the thing once the lung expands and it comes adheres, adheres to the chest wall all these air leaks settle down so what do we need to know about uh, why why we have uh, given such a big uh, thing is because we need to educate the primary care giver most of these pleural effusion get concentrated in a lot of primary care givers which can include your general practitioners include your pulmonologists your general medicine and all the 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 first thing that they comes to their mind when they uh, see a pleural effusion, they always think of TB. They don't even aspirate it. Sometimes they just put the patient on empirical ATT, and uh, and then they land up with complications. Then they try to aspirate. Then they screw up further. The patients get uh, distressed, and then they come back to us. So we need to educate the primary care giver about non-operative and operative management of empyema. And if uh, timely intervention and referral is not going to be done. then we lose a lot of valuable time and for the patient it's going to be very very difficult because as i said he he has to roam around with an icd for around 3 to 4 months with pain and then the icd eventually slipping out and causes excoriation of skin and then the chest wall becomes deformed and there's a huge scar as you can see in one of the pictures that i had shown you can see this patient had a bad scar tendency you can see the first i marked here the previous icd site they have put such a high up icd for a pleural effusion i don't know it's almost in the fourth space in the axilla they have put the icd and then the one that we have uh, put the incision in is the second uh, fifth intercostal space you put the access incision and then the camera port you see how he has a bad tendency to form scars
and always when you are operating tuberculosis patients we will be operating a lot of tb patients in our country it is ideal to have a adequate att cover before any kind of intervention especially in stage 2 and stage 3 because if you don't have a diagnosis then you don't have an option you need to go in and do some kind of a procedure if you have a diagnosis of tuberculosis and you still have an empyema it is better to take uh, ask the patient to take at least 6 to 8 weeks of att complete the intensive phase of att and then go ahead and do a surgical intervention because this att is uh, uh, is if you take the patient in the active phase of the disease the lung is going to be really friable and inflammation is going to be high you will end up tearing the lung at many places and cause a lot of parenchymal airway and always in in practice you try a minimally invasive approach before you go to open surgery because the pain is less the morbidity is less patients are back to work in no time uh, however in our country the uh, whether this is going to be applicable whether in our subset of patients is going to be applicable is entirely up to you because most of the time whenever a surgery is being done in an indian patient uh, Uh, the the family forces rest upon him family forces the convalescence upon him and he is made to sit at home and uh, not allowed to recover actually even though he has been done by vats he is just made into a sedentary lifestyle and thing so it's up to you you have to individualize for these patients before you take but my uh, take on this is try try a minimally invasive approach before going uh, for any kind of open surgery so that we but just at the cost of minimally invasive never try to compromise on the principles of surgery because minimally invasive might be as rosy as it gets but open surgery is the route so you need to in case you are having a problem never hesitate to open or anything i'm just telling minimally invasive because minimally invasive will be less painful for these patients yes. so i'd like to take any questions or any points that needs to be answered or i will conclude my talk sir uh, with this yeah sure Good evening, sir. Thank you for your uh, very extensive talk on this topic. Uh, if I may ask a few questions of you. Yeah, certainly, Dr. Vimala. Yes. Uh, first question would be: uh, What is your opinion on the role of uh, steroids Hello. in this? Oh. Radha, Hello, Krishna, sir. Are you here? Can you hear me? Hello. Ajay, could you get the question, Ajay? Hello. Hello, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible, uh, Dr. Vimala. Just uh, Ajay has to check his uh, audio. Yes, sir. Ajay, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Ajay? Hello. Can you hear me? Hello Ajay I think he seems to have some problem with this internet i think call through the lecture we had some issues yes sir i hope he'll come back we'll just wait for a while yes sir Yeah, Ajay, can you hear? Hello.
हेलो अजय हेलो हेलो विमला क्वेश्चन हेलो बट डॉक्टर विमला वांट्स नो द रोल ऑफ स्टेरॉइड्स इन स्टोर लिफ्यूशन that he's not able to hear any of us hello yeah uh, sir can you hear us now yeah i can hear you now yeah yes sir uh, what is your opinion on the role of steroids in uh, when we give apt cover sir along with uh, for uh, the treatment uh, for pleural effusion uh, secondary tuberculosis you mean with drainage or without drainage both situations sir both situations sir huh? yes sir yeah so without drainage i don't think uh, steroids theoretically they say it reduces the inflammation and reduces the incidence of loculations and all that but personally here in uh, madras medical college also we don't really follow much of steroid that is the patients that are referred to us they have not been on steroids at any point of time so i think it indu increases the chance of secondary bacterial infection especially when the patient is on an icd it is going to increase your chance of secondary bacterial infection and one more thing is when your patient is going to be on steroids for a long time what happens is following through following uh, surgery we want the chest wall and the lung to get stuck to each other but when you are giving steroids the inflammatory reaction is reduced and uh, the addition does not happen because it's an anti inflammatory thing and the chance of lung non expansion of lung might be there okay sir thank you so much sir i'd also like to ask you how long uh, can we try using an icd before we uh, refer to ctbs for further management sir that's what uh, if you want to go with the guidelines it is like 5 to 7 days if the patient is not getting better radiological resolution is not there it is the ideal time to refer to a surgeon however it is all individualized and the practice is individual based but if you see a split pleural assign automatically on an x ray or on an x ray or a ct and then you decide is already an empyema with a thickened pleura i really don't think you should waste time putting in an icd and then complicating things it is better to drain it off surgically if you are able to do it by medical thoracoscopy yes but if you are not able to do it by medical thoracoscopy i think it's better off being done by a surgeon using bags Yes, sir. Uh, the last question would be, sir, could you uh, give us a few points about the management of malignant pleural effusion as of now, sir? Okay, malignant pleural effusion is an entirely different entity. But yeah, the malignant pleural effusion. Whenever you see a patient with a known malignancy who is going to develop a pleural effusion, the first thing that you are going to do is aspirate the fluid and send it for cytology. If your cytology is going to be positive, if possible to do a therapeutic aspiration, I think. he is going to be in a terminal stage of malignancy let us not do much for him and uh, he is going to only symptomatic relief then it is better to go ahead and do a therapeutic aspiration relieve him of the dyspnea however if the fluid volume is going to be really massive and then you need to go ahead and do in a icd indwelling uh, sorry intercostal drainage tube and if you see the lung is going to expand and uh, still he is going to recur with the pleural effusion again then it is advisable to do any some kind of pleurodesis this pleurodesis can be a chemical pleurodesis such as beta den introduction into the pleural cavity via the icd however i am not a big fan of this introduction into the icd because the icd is going to be localized at one particular place the lung is going to be all around it so when you put 50 ml of beta den through the cavity even though it is being followed in our center i am not a big fan of it you give 50 ml of beta den through that and it is not going to get evenly distributed across the pleural cavity because by that time the the uh, most of the beta den stays in the tube and when you remove the icd after 6 to 8 hours and uh, the patient coughs and he gets one block block of beta den in the uh, surgical icd site anyway our the other option would be to take him to the theater introduce a thoracoscope under thoracoscopic guidance you can spray tag 
if it's a confirmed malignancy if you are sure it is malignancy you have a biopsy proven malignancy of the pleura never ever do a talc pleurodesis or any kind of pleurodesis for a benign condition it is going to complicate things for you and for the patient for a, and then however in some conditions you will see after the effusion has drained he has a right main bronchus growth and then he has a malignant pleural effusion his right main bronchus growth will prevent him uh, his lung from expanding he will be developing a huge space which means that lung is not going to expand further whatever you do that lung is not going to expand so you need to put in the tube and you are need to allow him to remain with the tube for a long time so in these cases you have one more option known as the indwelling pleural catheter it's a long pleural catheter you it is brought out through a subcutaneous tunnel in the skin and it can be folded nicely and kept within the patient's shirt whenever the patient feels a tightness in the chest this is a self care for the patient whenever the patient feels uh, tightness in the chest he can just connect the bag it will be like a tap he can just connect the bag and open the valve it will drain around in a ml of fluid then he can close the valve dispose the bag this uh, is available in india we have been doing it in chennai for the uh, past maybe 6 8 months we have been doing it's available in chennai now however it's slightly expensive uh, the bottles uh, have to be disposed and depends upon the volume of fluid that is going to come for the patient it is going to uh, cost the patient as much so it, the drainage frequency can be as much as one week uh, once per week or even every alternate day depends upon how the patient is going to think but all these should be done only when you have a diagnosis proven diagnosis of malignancy that can be proved either by cytology positivity or if you are not able to get it you need to do a pleural biopsy there is no according to me there is no role for closed pleural biopsy anymore it's always an open pleural biopsy or a thoracoscopic pleural biopsy either by a flexible or a rigid thank you sir is there any role for pleural stripping sir pleural stripping you mean a pleurectomy yes sir mechanical pleurodesis mechanical yes. pleurodesis is not good in malignancy because your malignancy the pathology is different the pathophysiology is different you have multiple nodules and everywhere they are going to think pleural stripping is very very useful in the management of pneumothorax where you strip you do a bullectomy combined with a pleurectomy for the first for intercostal spaces you literally strip the pleura i have a video maybe somewhere in youtube i have done a pleurectomy and a bullectomy where you can uh, strip the pleura entirely this will cause additions pneumothorax is very it's very useful in pneumothorax because it uh, the pneumothorax is generally concentrated in the apices so it goes and uh, sticks there okay, but you need to make sure you have removed all the bulle before you do a pleurectomy Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. But not for malignant diseases. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your great answers, sir. Much appreciated. Thank you. Any more questions, Dr. Kayur? You want to ask something? Dr. Bansal, you want to ask anything? You can. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Dr. Bansal. i had a patient reported to me and icd was put in the periphery about 3 months ago the tube was tied by a tamcha to his chest then he then puts it inside oh your 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 video uh, i think it got uh, audio got stuck for some time yeah Yes, sir. Raban sir, so, as sir has uh, Ajay sir has mentioned, need to yeah. teach the periphery, the primary care physicians, the primary uh, surgeons practicing in periphery regarding uh, non-surgical management. I agree and appreciate very much if that could be done. Yeah, yeah. it's our well, duty to educate the primary care doctors. Yeah. yeah, right, sir. that's all sir thank you so much sir, no more questions uh, thanks ajay uh, uh, thanks for the elaborate lecture thanks, and the sir. good answers we'll see you again tomorrow what will be a topic for tomorrow they have to tomorrow sir i'll just uh, uh, message you sir i have uh, make made ready a couple of topics i'll just uh, send okay, you okay okay thank you sir. so much thanks everyone who is watching this thank you thank, thank you, you sir. sir thank you very much thank you sir